So what do you look for when you're starting to look for the perfect house hack? When you're looking to get started as a house hacker, where you live in one unit and you use the rent from the other units to help pay the cost of the property. Welcome to the Rental Property Cafe. I'm Cynthia Meyer with Real Life Planning. And I'm Veronica Woods with Daniel Woods Real Estate. And we're here today in episode 16 to talk about how you evaluate a house hack. Veronica has brought some real life examples of properties she's looked at recently that we can use to discuss that. So Veronica, you're a house hacker, right? Yes, I've been house hacking for about four years now. Yes, I bought a duplex where I live on the second floor and I have a tenant that's helping me pay my mortgage. So I practice what I preach. That, I think that's excellent. And if I could go back and tell my 20 something self one thing, it would be to be a house hacker. And I wasn't, I was a renter who just paid somebody else's mortgage. <laughs> Um, so, that. <laughs> yeah. so that's why I thought we thought mm-hmm. we'd be a good topic because it's, it can be intimidating to find mm-hmm. the right deal that is a good fit for that purpose. So talking about it. Yeah. And so when we think about house hacking, a lot of times we think about, oh, this is for the first time home buyer who is looking to become both a homeowner and a landlord at the same time. But actually, as you've seen in your situation, it can also be a great setup for multi-generational families. I was talking to a client the other day who is house hacking in California, and they live on one side, and their older mother lives on the other side. That is true. And actually, this is like my third house that you were saying, the untraditional house Mm -hmm. hackers, because a lot of times I set out to be a house hacker on the second one, but I came up and just bought a regular house <laughs> because I couldn't find exactly what I was looking for. Mm-hmm. But I see that a lot of generational families are looking for multi-units or especially a place that has a first floor bedroom is ideal for mm-hmm. older older parents and relatives and everybody to live under one roof relatively. Yeah. So uh, more people are thinking about it. And as it becomes a more commonly known strategy, more people are purposefully doing it. Now, obviously, people have been doing this for hundreds of years, but they just didn't call it house hacking. <laughs> but <Right. laughs> and I guess a lot of times there, in, in especially in this area in Philadelphia, there are a lot of large single family houses, <laughs> six or seven bedrooms. And sometimes they carve up to have specific units. Sometimes they don't. And so he said for, this isn't a new phenomenon mm-hmm. that multi-generational grandparents and children living in one roof, this is the opportunity to potentially make money off of it in terms of maybe your family lives in part of it, but then you can have a tenant help you pay part of the rent. That's right. Because we all have to live somewhere, right? And the idea that you can live in a beautiful home, right? And if you're renting out one part of it, you know, whether it's another unit or maybe you're renting out your single family home as a house act, that income from the tenant can help pay your mortgage and interest in property taxes. It, it, it may or may not pay them completely depending on the market that you're in, but it's a real financial boost. It's really mighty factor in setting somebody up for later financial success, in my opinion. So you brought some listings, right? So you brought a couple of listings today. And I understand you, you've looked at both of these before, I think. Which one should we pull up first? I think you wanted to pull up the one that was already sold. So one of them yeah. is sold. So it's now on the market. Mm-hmm. Okay. So this is a triplex, right? In the Philly area. This is a triplex in the Western suburb of Philadelphia called Upper Darby. And it's cute. I look at it for the first time. I think this is a nice looking property, right? It looks like it's pretty well maintained on the outside. And we can see from the listing, it's got three units and it's illegally zoned as a triplex, right? So one of the questions you would always want to research is this, are they legal rental units? And just seeing that in the description, mm-hmm. that enough from a legal point of view. Ooh, that good point. So that would be a part of your due diligence. Any multifamily that wasn't originally built as a multifamily, in this neighborhood, they're mostly single-family homes. Your antenna should go up to just to make sure 
that the township has approved that. Like I said, any multifamily that wasn't originally built that way, it's really important for you to do that due diligence. So as we look through the description, let's say we want to decide, uh, okay, we want to go see this property, right? What are some of the things that we are looking for? Like I know when I'm looking at the outside, I think, and it looks like pretty nice. I think I'd like to go see it. I might have some questions about the roof. Of course, if you were in contract, you would answer in the inspection. And maybe there's anything that might be in the disclosures. What would you look for, Veronica? The first thing, if I was considering house hacking, mm-hmm. I would make sure I would feel comfortable living in the neighborhood. I know mm-hmm. when we talk about one of the first, besides how many mm-hmm. units it is and what the potential to rent out, would I want to live live in the area? That would be the first question. And oh, then, great question, right? Yeah. Is it, can I get to work? Anywhere. Can I get to public transportation? Is there a grocery store? Is it safe to walk alone at night? Yeah. Are you comfortable is a big, big question for a lot of people. And you might want to drive around the area to make that decision for yourself. And then just assess from the MLS, just a relative condition of the property. Is this like yeah, let's, a complete renovation? Are there tenants in it now? Uh huh. Sure. Say. Because if there's tenants, then I would want to look at the lease terms or because if there's a law, any long-term leases, then that would mean that would restrict how you would be able to take over as landlord. You would basically have to assume any long-term leases. With short-term leases in place, you could potentially say to the seller, hey, you need to deliver it vacant or I buy the property. And you might think about having it delivered vacant, maybe if you were going to be making renovations, you want to make them all at once, right? Or if there's a unit that you wanted to move into that is currently tenant occupied. Right? Good point about the, even the renovation. Mm-hmm. It's really hard to do renovations around the beginning property. The fixing of deferred maintenance is really tough. So if you uh-huh. plan to do any major renovations, you need to budget the property that you yeah. making for a period. So it looks like just summing through these interior shots, it looks like it, certainly one of the units has been nicely renovated. Maybe that was the owner's unit, who knows, of the seller. Did you go in this property, Veronica? Did you walk through it? I did. And actually, just another point of the pictures versus in real life could mm-hmm. be different. <laughs> people put pictures up before when it was vacant, that's the best look of the property. Before the tenant got in there and hung their the pictures owner up. The actually yeah. still living in there when oh, I yeah. lived there. Well, they had like a washer and dryer. You see the hookup. Yeah. The uh, living room. And there were definitely some people in that unit on the second floor. Uh-huh. They put pictures while it was vacant online, but that's not what I right. walked into. Right, right. Right. So that's already something in real estate in general. You can't go purely by the pictures because mm-hmm. from a marketing point of view, the realtors are going to put the best pictures forward. And you're thankful that you can see them out the furniture, but you can't go by the condition fully from the pictures. But you can kind of get an inkling like this where we're looking at. This is pretty dated. Right. Like, it's dated. It looks like the oven is old. Maybe we're going to have to replace that if, now or at some point, right? Could use a fresh coat of paint. But those are all easy, relatively inexpensive things to change. But I always think when I'm, when my husband Steve and I are looking for a new property, before we even go out and look at them, I always look through all the pictures and uh, I'm not necessarily going to let minor renovations get in the way of a good property, right? Like that stuff is not hard to do. It's the major structural work that if you find something structural in your review of the property or in the inspection where it might really give you pause. Would do you agree with that? I do think it makes sense to look at the mm-hmm. photos before getting your car and driving yeah. to a listing or asking anyone to do that. The other thing I do, if there's a property that has potential, mm-hmm. I'm calling the listing agent and say I have a client that's interested mm-hmm. and trying to get mm-hmm. more insight that. They won't put in writing. So you guys have to understand that there's some things they're just not going to put in writing. Sure. Don't want to document that, but I could get insight on the tenants or known repair that I should say in Pennsylvania and a number of states, the sellers are required to disclose detail about the property when they're putting it on the market. 
Most of the time, they make that document available on the MLS. Sometimes they don't for whatever reason, but you can and you have to ask for it. Okay. So now I would do a pictures and then I would ask for the seller's disclosure if it's available. And mm-hmm. then those mechanical issues that you alluded to that you, you can't really see from pictures, you can get a sense of like how much repairs are really required for the property. So I think that's an excellent point. But just looking at this picture here, right, I see that units are, looks like units are separately metered. And you'd have to tell me, Veronica, is this like two gas and two electric or four separate meters for the gas or the electric? I think it's really interesting that the seller posted them, first of all, very helpful. Because buying a house hack, right, you want to know, are your tenants going to be able to pay their own utility bills? Right. These are Mm -hmm. all electric meter. That's all oh, I can make. Right. Right. So there might be a house meter and three separate three, three separate individual units. Yeah. That is something that I try to look for in the pictures mm-hmm. separate meters. Are you, or in the basement, are you seeing separate hot water tanks? And right. I think we saw water. some separate ones. Yeah. It's, so we have those this... things that you would try to find out. Yeah. And make, or you, I would ask the question, which is not clear. So they're showing two or the third and one. this third one. Yeah. Yeah, like, you would try to find out in the end. <laughs> and, and I will say, I don't always see these kinds of pictures. Do you? Where somebody is taking pictures of the utilities and putting them in the listing. It's very helpful, actually, to be able to see that. That's my practice because people mm-hmm. have that question. So, yeah. in the realtor is trying to market the unit, energy. there are mm-hmm. examples where it's just like one picture. And then that mm-hmm. leaves a lot to be desired. But the more information, that you can provide without people having to draw, leave their house. The better. Yeah. So this, I think this is really interesting. And this looks like it's a basement unit. Maybe this is the, is this the studio? Because not a lot of windows yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, so seeing that picture and even like they did mention that it's legally zoned. Yeah. They that point because they know that would be a question. Based yeah. On- the layout and the other houses on that street uh-huh. that's the basement for those properties but it did have an exterior and oh it did so it had egress it yeah. yeah okay yes. because i would look at this and you may have had the same thought think mm-hmm. it can't you're not going to get good rent for this bottom unit without a window and i'm sure that the window issue that is hard to see from the pictures and actually that was the one I had trouble getting into on the inside, but I did see the door. And one question I generally should ask, like rentability. Mm-hmm. So just because there's multiple, oh, there's sometimes there's yeah. one unit that may, yeah. I don't know, let's call it suboptimal in terms of, you know, would this attract a person who wants to stay there long term or a transient type tenant? So that's just something to think about. If mm-hmm. you evaluate this, even though it's three mm-hmm. units, if you have a two unit that would be more long term tenant, mm-hmm. less turnover, you kind of have to evaluate the trade offs of just having an extra unit, but maybe you attract a more transient tenant versus property where all the units are, you know, great layout and where people but, probably mm-hmm. there for multiple years. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. So, what else would we? What else would you want to look at in? Uh, oh, we're back to the beginning here. Anything else that we look at in the listing before we started to run the numbers for a particular property? I think there's probably enough to mm-hmm. the location and for this property, you're saying okay, it may need some repairs, but everything is pretty much mm-hmm. cosmetic. That's probably enough for me. To say, okay, I want to get in my car and look at it in person. Go and look at it. Well, yeah. More assumptions. Yeah. yeah. And it, now, one of the things that I know we would both do is to figure out what is the market rent for similar units. So in this property, there are three units, assuming that everything is legally zoned, again, which Veronica says, we've got a trust bud verify, right? So we've got a one bed, two, one bedroom, one bath, and then the studio, right? So you would, for example, take the address and go to rent a meter and put in one bedroom, one bath and see what is the median or average rent in the geographic area for a unit like that. Maybe even if you can try and look, go to Zillow or something and look or apartments.com and look at other listings in the area to see what you're in competition with. What else would you do? I think run a quick number. So mm-hmm. 
looking at the rent, right? So do a quick math with, okay, my mortgage payment is based on what their asking price is. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people get caught up with, oh, they're asking 265. I need to run the numbers at 265. You may be able to get a discount. Figure out what the monthly debt service would be and then run a quick cash flow to see if mm -hmm. you have any chance of being positive with the current rents. Oh, good point. Uh, Especially with taxes in certain areas in near Upper Darby, lift towns could be right back to back, but have very different tax scenarios. Mm -hmm. so you have to kind of evaluate the taxes along with your debt service, your mortgage, and then will the rents have a chance to cover that and operate? Mm -hmm. Because if you come out negative just at that quick level, there's no chance based yeah. on the owner is being just totally unrealistic about what they want to sell mm -hmm. or. It's not even worth it. You just can't make magic out of the numbers working if it's just priced too high. A lot of times we see that with the properties that have some renovations done. And quite frankly, that's why my client didn't want that friction. Mm -hmm. One, they were looking at the numbers just didn't work with the mm -hmm. rent. The day, the market rents you get. Yeah. I think the, the actual... Like the final price was 265. I think they wanted even more than that. It come down. But this was an example that just running the numbers up at the closer to the asking mm -hmm. price, the potential rents would be. It's, it's that just doesn't hard. work. Yeah. 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 And that happened. So I want to point out for anyone who's doing this for the first time, right? This is on the taxes and the school and county tax too are on the listing. Right. So easy to find out. You can often, if you're looking at a Zillow listing, for example, or, or Redfin or Trulia, that you can see the estimated property taxes and estimated property and casualty insurance payments and homeowners policy payments. What you won't see are the other estimated costs that you, if you're getting serious about dating this property before you buy it, you want to run a full budget, right? A full year one budget that also includes the cost of a property manager. If you need one, projected maintenance costs based on the age of the structure, certainly any renovation costs you need to do, maybe we could dig into that a little bit. Uh, and then things like snow removal or landscaping and that sort of thing, making sure that you've got a realistic view of what it's going to cost you to live there. As the house hacker, you have responsibility for your own unit, right? But you also have to have responsibility for the other parts of the property if it's not rented or if the renter is not paying their rent. Takeaway from what we're seeing is if this quick math is red and negative, becomes not a house hack, it's not going to serve you as an investment. There's running the numbers with you living in it, and there's running the numbers with you having it as a complete investment. Those are two kind of quick math things that you should do. And if it will never be a profitable investment, then it just doesn't make sense to take anything further. That's an excellent point, Veronica, and worth repeating. If I hear you correctly, you're saying it, that if it wouldn't make sense if you ever moved out of it as a profitable rental, even if it could be an attractive house act in the long run, it, it might not be a great investment because you may not want to live there forever. If your exit strategy is to keep as a long-term rental, mm -hmm. then it's important to look at those numbers up front because you're evaluating your exit strategy. Now, if you plan to just sell it, just like the single family house, then that's different. So there may be a reason for you to like, man, I really like this house mm -hmm. because it will never be a profitable investment. It's still offsetting some of my costs. So I'm going to live here for a while and then sell it. But that's not really fully... Uh, house hackers mentality. I know you recently looked at another property. Should we pull that one up on the screen and talk a little bit about how it's different and some potential renovation questions? Okay. I think the other example will allow us to dive into some questions you mm -hmm. can ask about renovating the property. So looks like this one's a triplex too. What can you tell us about this? Did they they are new property. Yeah. Just, the, just the plot you have. Yeah. It's, it's not attached. There's a pretty significant backyard mm -hmm. space for parking, off street parking and whatnot. So there's mm -hmm. definitely more landscaping expenses and the mm -hmm. units are larger. Mm -hmm. well, it's a two bedroom. 
two two bedrooms and then a studio on the third floor. This property is in a little, it needs a little bit more love to have it fully rented mm-hmm. out, which brings up the point about the renovation. Mm-hmm. If I were looking to buy a home that I wanted to live in for a lot, for quite a while, and also rent out the other side of the property, right? Are they side by side or there, is it a flat, like an upper and a lower? Uh, they're each on one floor. Each on one floor. Okay. So I would think this is pretty attractive. In fact, one of my sisters lives in a, a property like this as a house hacker and, and has been very successful in paying off her, almost paying off her mortgage completely 15 years early because of doing that. Um, but, but I would think this was pretty interesting. What else did you find when you looked through it? Should we go through some of these pictures here? I don't think there's as many good pictures or a well, exterior. Yeah. Show. Here we go. Okay. Yeah, so those pictures of the first floor unit. That nice. looks made. rentable. Yeah. And this is another one that when I walk inside, it not look like this. Oh, oh really? <laughs> That's it. I was like, I had to look back at the picture. So they did chicken's age where uh-huh. we look a little bit better than it does in person. So that's why I really emphasize you can't. Yeah. By the pictures. Yeah, you not, shouldn't not just buy a house on the internet, right? You don't buy the go in. Yeah. Terrify because this is just marketing. So I just find a few holes in the wall, let's say. Uh-huh. So it needs a little love. That's yeah. that is strange. What is that? Yeah. The kids yeah. kind of have a little odd layout. This was a building that wasn't literally one of these older buildings. Uh-huh. A triplex, but yeah. they did a good job of cutting it up into three units. Uh, I don't think. But oh, I, so this one's a triplex, not a duplex. I, I think yeah, that's what you said. Triplex. Yeah. Okay. Obviously, this is probably more than just a cleanup, right? That's a, maybe some regrouting here of this tub, but again, not super expensive yeah. to do. Honestly, most of the stuff was cosmetic when you're evaluating the yeah. house pack. And I'll use my example, mm-hmm. it's not on the screen. So when I looked at the property, both units were occupied. In that case, I picked the one, I evaluated the tenants and said, okay, I feel comfortable living in this one. And I already had cash flow from the first floor unit. Situation like this, you're evaluating, okay, I'm pretty much starting from scratch. Okay, so what's my timeline to have this? Rent ready in, allow me to live in. Mm-hmm. Well, just evaluating the timeline will be important in terms of when you could actually start collecting rent and make it an investment versus just doing the renovation. That right. timeline is going to be important. And what you may want something where I know I can just move in one and then mm-hmm. you can slowly rent out the other. So if you don't really have the capital to do all the renovation at once or where it makes sense, where one is definitely a quicker renovation and I can move mm-hmm. in and so forth. So it just really requires just thinking through the renovation timeline and the renovation partner. Now, this case, it's pretty much always cosmetic for people. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And a lot of my clients are not necessarily chasing a $100,000 renovation budget on a house hack, typically. Mm-hmm. Um, you want to so- make sure you have somebody that can do the work quickly and their partner after you assess hey i want to do this then really do you have somebody that could work on your timeline to get it ready for you or a tenant to move in that's right and if you're planning to do some of the work yourself being realistic about how long it's going to take you to do it we've all seen the renovation show right where the homeowners over estimate their own capacity to get work done or their own abilities to get work so I think that's a, that's a really interesting point. With this particular property, what other questions did you ask yourself as you were walking through it? I think in terms of the renovation, but just speaking on being conservative, even if you're saying, oh, I'll do some of this myself and I'll just pay for the others, the rest of it, making sure you really account for what you do see, mm-hmm. what you can't see, like when you open a wall or really look mm-hmm. behind something that maybe you only had a cursory look at when you were at your home inspection and really have a contingency. Everybody should have a contingency yes. percent in the budget. You don't want to just have an optimistic budget just to make you feel good to get your mortgage. And then the reality, 
you know, if you're like 10,000 short, like where is it going to come from? And it really want to be prepared that if there's like a $10,000 surprise that yeah. you aren't for them. You have liquidity for that, right? You have some cash available or some borrowing available from that. So interestingly, if the, that brings up the idea of talking to your lender, right? Are you going to be able to borrow enough to, to buy the property and complete the renovations if you need to borrow for the renovations? And so there are certain types of loan programs to do that. How would you bring this to a lender? Like, how would you initiate that conversation? Early, something, the biggest mistake I see people making is not being upfront with their lender about what they're trying mm -hmm. to do. They're really so stuck on the acquisition budget. And I find that I need to almost sometimes intervene and make sure that conversation happens. Did you tell them about the renovation by the Oh, no. He like, needs to know that because let's say it's some sort of commercial loan where they're loading against the after repair value. Let's say well, usually 75% of after repair value or 80% mm -hmm. cost. So they need to know all those numbers or you could potentially not be able to get the loan because of late disclosure to the lender. But it looks bad when we didn't fully account for the renovation budget, which is generally the debt to for construction loans is usually more expensive. Mm -hmm. so I can talk to my client like, well, after that point, it was maybe it's about 40,000 of renovations or have you thought about how you're going to finance it? Are you thinking about your home equity line of credit? Mm -hmm. Or do you want to roll it into the loan? Let's talk about this up front because that will affect what kind of offer we put forward and what kind of loan approval that we need. So, yeah. early... so get, getting to the idea, which you and I talk about all the time, right, is it's a team, right? You need it. You want a team, right? Financial guidance you're getting from your tax advisor, your financial planner, from your realtor, from your lender, from your insurance agent, right? That you want everybody singing from the same song sheet on this so that you're prepared for all of those unexpected things. The loan program that I think that I'm thinking of, the FHA loan program, where you can do a low down payment mortgage and then also borrow for renovations, that's two or three K, right? Is it two or three K? Yeah. So, Veronica, okay. anything else? We've tackled the idea of what's a house hack and why do it, right? Different types of people who might benefit from house hacking. We talked about reviewing the listing for details, certainly evaluating the current tenants and the potential rents. We talked about preparing for unexpected, having a lot of liquidity, roping in your lender into the conversation, running all the numbers. Is there anything else that this new house hacker should be thinking about, right, as they're evaluating potential listings to go see? My other thing, I may have glossed over it, New newer investors are afraid to take on the properties that have existing tenants. I'm not saying that they don't bring their own new headaches to the things to consider, yeah. but a lot of times that's why people are selling their tired landlords, so they are tenants involved. Wouldn't just gloss or kind of rule those properties out that have tenants in it. You do have the opportunity to ask for it to be delivered vacant. You arrange a closing date that would allow the owner to tell the tenant that they have to move and right in a legal way. Yeah. You're out of the property before you even get the keys in a legal way. He just kicked the tenants out. Yeah. So I didn't talk about if they're on the month of mom versus the long term lease. But there are a lot of opportunities of that where um, there are tenants living in it now. You could, like me, it was fully occupied. And I kicked one tenant to stay. The other was given the, the notice that we had to move out. And it, it worked out. So those things do work out. And uh, the same tenant is still here. I think I so it worked out pretty well. Yeah. Having a tenant occupied property can actually help you buy the property, right? So if you're buying a property and you're going to live on one side and you have a long-term lease for the tenant on the other side that you're going to keep, Right there, that income from the lease can be counted as part of the income formula in getting a mortgage. There could be some benefits and disadvantages, right? So, Ryan, as usual, it's an amazing conversation in the Rental Property Cafe. I'm looking forward to taking this idea and maybe looking at some different deals, right? Some single family deals, some multifamily deals, and talking about them in the same way. Does that sound good? Yeah, hopefully we can get good feedback if our viewers like this one. We can definitely do more of these because these are just mimicking the conversations mm -hmm. that we have on a routine basis for our clients anyway. Yeah. Well, 
have an excellent day. Thank you everyone for joining us in the Rental Property Cafe and hit the subscribe button so you'll be notified of the next conversation.